Alrighty. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the March Cocktails and Fishtails. We are so excited to be coming at you live over Facebook via Zoom meeting with the fabulous Chris Gendry here. So as we let y'all tune in, get comfortable, we always like to ask our presenters, Chris, will you share your favorite cocktail and a wild fish tail? <laughs> sure, yeah. I would say my favorite cocktail currently is a margarita. Uh, <laughs> um, and then it's kind of hard to pick a favorite fish tail because I work mainly with invertebrates, <laughs> team invertebrates. Um, but I would say the first one that comes to mind would be my um, field work out on Willapa Bay. I worked out there summer of the pandemic and the first summer. And I um, would go out on the boat with my, my uh, coworkers to get to our sites and we would see huge white sturgeon jumping uh, all over the bay. Uh, and it was just a cool sight to see. They can grow up to like six feet. So pretty, pretty fun commute to work. <laughs> yeah, and as far as the like, I saw a fish this big, that's a good fish tail. <laughs> exactly, yeah. <laughs> Uh, love it. Well, for those of you tuning in, again, welcome to Cocktails and Fishtails. Uh, we would love for you to post in the comments where you're watching from. And of course, as we go along tonight, uh, ask any questions you have so you can have those answered live at the end of Chris's presentation. Uh, I, of course, want to share a little fish tale of our own about Chris. Uh, I was telling him earlier how hard the Harbor Wild Watch ladies were fangirling over the fact that he was joining us tonight. Uh, Chris, once upon a time, uh, was a wee bitty sun star or well sea star, sea star student in our little education program. I'm trying to multitask and pull up uh, this really cute picture for you all, because look at this glory. This is Chris. I was almost going to say, I think now you're in your prime, but uh, in your young prime, uh, all about stewardship, helping us to uh, fulfill the Harbor Wild Watch mission of inspiring stewardship. And I don't know, uh, Chris, you really, I think, embody some of our, our uh, vision of catalyzing uh, marine stewards for the future because here you are as a sea star student off to study sea stars as a scientist full grown and of course lots of other things which we get to hear about tonight so uh i don't know it's really really just a magical thing to have this full circle moment with you and uh we look forward to learning more about your work with the washington state aquatic reserves tonight so uh again for those of you tuning in ask those questions in the comments and uh, we'll filter those your way at the end, Chris. So, uh, and then of course I have some announcements at the end too, but enough about that. We're so excited to have you. I'm gonna turn it over to you, Chris. Awesome, thank you, Stina. I'm going to work on sharing my screen. Okay, and can everyone hear me okay? Can you hear me okay, Stina? I can hear you great. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so my name is Chris Gendry and I'm a Puget Sound Corps team member with the Washington Department of Natural Resources. And the title of my presentation is Washington State's Aquatic Reserves, Protecting Local Ecosystems Through Stewardship and Science. Hmm, maybe, there we go. All right, so I also, <laughs> snagged that photo <laughs> for my my background slide but um I do first off just want to say how excited I am to be presenting here tonight um I've been like Sina said volunteering with Harbor Wild Watch for a really long time and I'm grateful to have the chance to present with all of you now about my current position the full circle story I guess <laughs> Um, so I grew up in Gig Harbor, Washington, and started volunteering with Harbor Wild Watch back in 2007 when I was a student in, I think, one of the first or like first few Sea Star classes, uh, Sea Stars and Beyond education classes, um, when I was in fourth grade. Um, now, um, I really credit Harbor Wild Watch with a lot of um, the like start of my passion for marine biology and working outdoors. And uh, to this day, 
going back and volunteering, like some of my favorite parts of the year involve the uh, summer and winter beach monitoring efforts that I get to join Sina and Mike and lots of lots of other Harbor Wild Watch friends. So it's been fun to continue work with all these people over the years. Um, in June 2020, I graduated from UW and I uh, earned my Bachelor of Science in Biology. And also Harbor Wild Watch is a huge reason why I did choose to study biology in college and uh, why I'm pursuing a career in the biological field. Uh, currently, I'm an AmeriCorps member with the Department of Natural Resources Aquatic Reserves Program. I started back there in October of 2020, and I'm currently in my second year uh, working as an AmeriCorps member with this program. So here's a short outline of my talk. I am first just going to give you an overview of my current position. And then I'm going to go into some background information about each aquatic reserve. There's eight in total. And then I'll finish it off with details about my favorite projects that we do. So that includes seagrass monitoring and uh, green crab monitoring as well. And really my goals to today are to introduce you to the beauty of these uh, special places throughout the, the state and to show you some of the cool work that we get to do. Uh, and share my experiences over the past year and a half or so that I've been uh, with this program. And then I also plan on sharing some, some more resources at the end in case you are curious about learning more or uh, wanna get involved. Um, and then once again, please feel free to put questions you have for me in the chat. I'd love to answer those at the end of my presentation. All right. So my position um, falls under the umbrella of the Washington Conservation Corps, uh, which is WCC. It's an AmeriCorps program that uh, is housed within the Washington Department of Ecology, and it provides conservation-based field experience to 18 to 25 year olds. So it's a, uh, or if you don't already know, AmeriCorps is a national uh, service organization, and they partner with a bunch of different organizations. So WCC is one of those partners. And then WCC partners with organizations throughout Washington state. Uh, so organizations like DNR partner with WCC in order to have the help of AmeriCorps members like myself to conduct um, whatever research they need help with. Um, and then there's also two different types of positions within WCC. There's the field crews and then individual placements. I am an individual placement and these positions often require a college degree and are often working independently within their service organizations, but I am lucky enough to work with a team of fellow individual placements, which is the photo here on, on the right, my current team out in the boat. And um, the crews on the other hand work mainly outdoors and they do really cool projects around the state on things like building and maintaining trails, uh, habitat restoration, and even disaster response. So really this uh, WCC is really just a great opportunity for folks that are looking for like hands-on experience after high school or college. And again, please feel free to ask me if you're curious about <clears throat> WCC. It's a really fun opportunity and uh, I can definitely tell you a lot more about it, but for the sake of time, I'll move on. <laughs> And I'll move on to the uh, Aquatic Reserves Program. So you might be wondering what even are aquatic reserves. And I wondered the same thing when I was first applying. Um, they are designated areas created to promote the preservation and restoration, as well as enhancement of state-owned aquatic lands. So all eight reserves are established within one or more of three categories, including environmental, scientific, and or educational importance. And currently, like I said, there's eight reserves, uh, seven are marine reserves, and then our newest reserve way in the bottom is Lake Capacin, which is our only freshwater reserve. They have the primary goal to protect uh, native ecosystems. So this uh, designation as an aquatic reserve uh, however, does not affect things like private property or hunting or fishing. And one helpful comparison I've learned is that aquatic reserves are somewhat like the aquatic uh, counterpart to state parks on the land. So 
recreations permitted on both people can still visit most of the reserves and um, stewardship is is definitely a top priority within our reserves uh, and then in order to protect the native ecosystems and achieve that goal we conduct a lot of ecological monitoring projects in each reserve and that's kind of a massive undertaking because there's so so many reserves and uh, a lot of help goes into sharing these responsibilities. So that's where the citizen stewardship committees come into play. And these are community volunteer teams who steward their local aquatic reserve and meet regularly to share updates and conduct monitoring efforts. And they're really a vital component of our monitoring because they're really the most like up to date on current events in their reserves. And they're really important advocates for the stewardship of our native habitats and species. And I, I really see a lot of similarities between CSC uh, CSCs or citizen stewardship committees and Harbor Wild Watch. There's a lot of overlap there between, you know, stewardship, uh, like the sign I was holding in the beginning. <laughs> it's a top priority and it's great to see community members coming together to uh, share, have a shared passion of caring about the environment. Um, and then we also get a lot of help from partnerships with local tribes government agencies, nonprofit organizations, and then also the Puget Sound Corps team, which is my position that was originally established in 2012. And then I just wanted to give a huge shout out to my current team on the left and my team from last term on the right. Um, these are just a bunch of really amazing humans and scientists. And I'm so glad that I've been able to work with all of them. And they really make this work a lot of fun because we get to travel to some really cool places and spend a lot of time together and uh yeah just really grateful for them so this kind of goes to show how science is a, a really a big team effort and collaboration that brings together people from all sorts of backgrounds and experiences to achieve uh, common goals uh, so we conduct long-term ecological monitoring on our uh, eight reserves with numerous projects that i'll get into later but first i would love to um share some background information on each reserve so here's a clear map of our eight reserves and i'm just going to work north to south and share some highlights about each one and some pretty pictures so cherry point aquatic reserve is our northernmost reserve in the state and it's located just north of bellingham and one of the unique features of this reserve is the presence of um, industry, such as oil refineries and the deep water channels that allow for shipping that goes along with it. So I circled some of those uh, piers that jut out into the water associated with these industries up in Cherry Point. And then there's also a lot of really critical habitats and species within the Cherry Point Aquatic Reserve. And many of these species have actually experienced population declines <clears throat> recently, such as the surf scoter, uh, dungeon nest crab and the uh, southern resident orcas but the cherry point herring stock is another uh, population that has faced declines from approximately 13,000 metric tons in 1973 to between 1200 and 250 metric tons over the last 10 years so a really drastic decrease and i'll show a graph of that in in a few slides here uh, but we care about this because pacific herring are a species that's classified as a forage fish and forage fish are a really critical piece of the food web they uh, feed on plankton and then bigger fish like salmon feed on the forage fish and orcas feed on the salmon so that's kind of a really simplified pathway of the food web but it goes to show how the decline of one of these species can really have uh, wide widespread effects on our local uh, food webs and then here's that graph I was talking about. We're really gonna focus in here on the red line, which is our trade point stock. That clearly shows the decline over time. Um, we've actually have funding in our program to research and monitor the herring decline up at Cherry Point. And that's through our light trap project, which I'll mention more about again towards the end. <laughs> so moving on to our second reserve, that's uh, moving south, Cypress Island Aquatic Reserve. And this is probably my uh, favorite reserve because it's really largely like an undeveloped and uh, untouched landscape with really beautiful, pristine habitats. And whenever I get to visit this island, it 
reminds me of what the Salish Sea looked like prior to colonial settlement. And it it's really cool to have these places to remind us of the importance of protecting our natural spaces. And obviously we have to, the only way to get to this island is via boat. So uh, it's super fun to come up on these, you know, quiet, peaceful harbors and get to sample where uh, not many people often visit. And it's just a really beautiful place. Uh, and then this is a picture I took from a hike on the island in between surveys. Uh, so it's a really gorgeous island to visit. It's located near the San Juan Islands, and as you can see, the reserve uh, surrounds the entire perimeter of Cypress Island. Not only is the aquatic uh, ecosystem protected on Cypress Island, but also a lot of the uplands, because there's a natural area preserve and the natural resources conservation area also managed by the Department of Natural Resources. Uh, and just to give you a kind of a more evidence of how untouched this this land is only 2% of the shoreline has been modified of nearly 20 miles of shoreline. So very few houses on the island. It's, it's really a, a gorgeous spot. <clears throat> and then some of the important habitats and species on Cypress Island include uh, kelp beds, rockfish. There's even a mink whale that we had the opportunity to see last summer and then lots of pocket beaches. <laughs> And moving on to our third uh, third aquatic reserve, which is Fidalgo Bay. You can see here in the uh, foreground, it's a, a really productive ecosystem because of its location in a really shallow and sheltered uh, bay here. So Fidalgo Bay is located just east of Anacortes and it's surrounded by a lot of uh, industry and uh, indu uh, um, Things like Highway 20 runs right along the shoreline. So there's a lot of reasons why it's important to monitor these aquatic lands with all of this um, human activity going, along, going, on, going on around its uh, shoreline. And while Fidalgo Bay may be one of our smaller aquatic reserves in area, it still includes many important habitats and species, such as native eelgrass beds, native Olympia oysters, uh, and surf smoke, which is another one of our forage fish friends. And then I really love this uh, low tide mosaic of Fidalgo Bay because it shows how the bay is a prime habitat for, it's a large mudflat, so it's prime habitat for eelgrass, which you can see those greens, uh, green areas. And uh, eelgrass is a really important habitat for so many species uh, as like a spawning area, uh, a refuge, a uh, um, nursery spot. It's a, it's a really high quality structured habitat for many species. And another cool project that has been done on in Fidalgo Bay is uh, Olympia oyster restoration. So starting in 2002, the estimated abundance of native oysters, in, which are the Olympia oysters in Fidalgo Bay has increased from about 50,000 oysters to about 4.8 million oysters in 2016. So that, is a multi-partner project that is a huge success story in our reserve. And I just definitely wanted to highlight that. Uh, Fidalgo Bay is also one of the only places uh, in the Puget Sound where surf smelts will spawn year round. So they will lay their eggs on the upper zone of intertidal beaches within sand and gravel uh, sediment. And if you have the chance to visit Fidalgo Bay, you may be able to just pick up some of that upper intertidal beach and hopefully find some surf smelt eggs, which are the little tiny white spheres that you can see in the photo on the left. They uh, are approximately one millimeter in diameter, so about the size of a tip of, the tip of a pencil. And I showed some I showed some photos of the uh, eggs and a larva that I took under microscopes just different stages of development of these forage fish. And so part of my job is actually to search for these eggs in sediment samples that we collect on um, all of our reserves, actually. All right, moving on to Smith and Minor Islands Aquatic Reserve. So this is the largest reserve, and the islands that 
are its namesake are actually some of the smallest that we visit. And they're shown here, Smith on the left and Miner on the right. They lie about five miles off the western shore of Whidbey Island. And they are managed by the uh, US Fish and Wildlife Service. And so in order to protect sensitive wildlife, such as nesting seabirds and marine mammals, uh, Smith and Miner Islands are closed to the public year round and boats must stay 200 yards from the shore. However, we as scientists receive a special permit to visit these islands for scientific monitoring, paying special attention to avoid areas that are closed off for breeding, uh, breeding grounds for various species. Species such as these. <laughs> the uh, Smith and Minor Islands Aquatic Reserve has the largest persistent bull kelp bed in Washington state. Um, here's a cool shot of some orcas we saw on our boat trip out to those islands just last month. Um, and then the sand spits uh, within this reserve are also really prime habitat for marine mammals such as harbor seals, elephant seals, sea lions that will haul out and chill out on these, these sand spits. And then marbled merlets are also found in this reserve and they are listed as a threatened species at the state and federal level. So here's some photos from our trip last month to the islands. And I just really feel lucky to be able to visit islands where a few people get to go. And uh, with the goal of having a positive and lasting impact on the ecology of these places uh, feels really, really cool. So yeah, we pick up as much trash as we can. <laughs> Okay, so next we have Protection Island Aquatic Reserve, which similarly to Smith and Minor is also managed by the US Fish and Wildlife Service. So the public is also never allowed to visit this island and boats must stay 200 yards away from the shore at all times. But again, <laughs> we receive special permits to visit on island for scientific monitoring like we did last month here. And the restrictions are also in place to protect nesting seabirds and resting uh, marine mammals. So here's a overview of where Protection Island is up in the northeast corner of the Olympic Peninsula. And uh, one thing to remember about Protection Island is that it is bird paradise. So uh, Protection Island is actually one of the most important seabird nesting locations in Washington. Approximately 70% of the nesting seabird population of Puget Sound and the Strait of Juan de Fuca will nest on Protection Island. So almost three quarters of the birds utilize this small island. And one, it's one of the largest nesting colonies of rhinoceros auklets uh, in North America, which are those friends up in the right, upper right, and the largest nesting colony of glaucous winged gulls. And then it's Protection Island is also one of the few remaining spots where uh, rhinoceros auklets and tufted puffins will nest in the Puget Sound. And then of course, can't leave out the chonky elephant seal that we saw uh, last month on our visit to the island, shown here in the middle. <laughs> okay, so Moria Island is next. That is probably the closest uh, geographic reserve to Gig Harbor and similar, uh, lots of similar habitats and species as well. So Moria Island is sort of a island connected by a small land bridge to Vashon Island here in the South Sound. And some of the uh, vi vital habitats and species that can be found here are eelgrass, uh, ochre sea stars, and uh, also lots of forage fish and shellfish that utilize the extensive mudflats of places like Quirra Master Harbor, uh, which is also a really prime refuge site for migratory wintering and resident marine birds. So Western greaves will actually winter over in Quirra Master Harbor. And then next we have our final uh, marine reserve, which is Nisqually Reach. So the cool thing about this reserve is that it uh, borders the Billy Frank Jr. Uh, Nisqually National Wildlife Refuge, which is shown here in pink 
on the map on the right. It's, as many of you probably know, a really critical place for uh, birds. And also it's the uh, estuary of the Nisqually River, which travels all the way from Mount Rainier down and empties into the, the sound. So it's a great spot for Chinook salmon and other uh, salmonids. Um, and it's great that the Nisqually Reach Reserve sort of continues that protection on up north to the southern shores of McNeil Island. So one of my favorite species is commonly found in Nisqually Reach, and that's the pigeon guillemot. They're a really charismatic bird that will actually nest in these burrows on the side of cliffs. So there's a photo of one entering a cliff, and they'll often bring a uh, species like gunnels and then also sand lance in to feed their young. So there's a photo of sand lance here in the lower right that is probably also one of my favorite forage fish. They just are kind of a derpy little fellow. Um, okay, so our final reserve is our only freshwater reserve, uh, Lake Kapowson. So this is located approximately one hour east of Olympia. And the reserve covers basically the entire lake. It's a uh, interesting spot with a really fascinating geological history. So approximately 500 years ago, this lake was created by the Electron Lahar, which is basically just a giant mudslide that rushed down the Puyallup Valley from Mount Rainier and dammed uh, Kapowson Creek. And then that flooded the valley floor of what is now known as Lake Kapowson and drowned the forest there. So to this day, there are tree stumps from this forest that still remain and provide a lot of valuable habitats for organisms, um, as well as an obstacle for boating on this lake. But the cool thing about Lake Kapowson is that we find a lot of really unique species that we don't find in any of our other reserves, obviously, because it's freshwater. So we conduct um, amphibian surveys out at this lake, and we get to see cool uh, egg masses such as the Northwestern Salamander egg mass in the lower left corner, which are about the size of a grapefruit and uh, kind of gooey and squishy. And then my favorite uh, amphibian is the rough skin newt. They have a really cool, uh, uh, a really cool fact about the rough skin newt is that they are um, highly toxic, but they are preyed upon by one species in particular, the garter snake, which actually also develops uh, sort of uh, resistance to that toxin over time. And they kind of have, are battling it out um, evolutionarily to <laughs> see who will win, who will become more toxic or more uh, resistant over time. So that's just a fun fact that I love about the, the rough skin newt. And then this lake is also stocked with a lot of native and stock or native and stock sport, uh, sport fish, such as coho salmon and rainbow trout. And there's a lot of really beautiful waterfowl as well. And then my favorite project uh, that we do here is our habitat restoration site, which is shown here on the left, kind of in its initial stages. It was a, approximately one acre of land that was just covered in invasive blackberry brambles. And over the years, multiple Puget Sound Corps teams have helped to convert this area back into a native uh, forest. So you can see here on the right is a picture from my first term where we had, were in the process of planting native trees and shrubs. And uh, it's just been really cool to work at the same site over time, revisit it and see it changing through all the hard work that we do. So here's some of my, me and my team from last term and then the maintenance continues to this day with my current term. It's always fun to get back there and keep up all of the work that we've done. And then here's a photo of our first uh, water quality survey of the, of the term out at Lake Kapowson. We check for, uh, the, we monitor the water quality out here as well. And it's really rewarding to not only be out on this lake, but in all the waters throughout um, the Puget Sound to visit these places while also making a, a positive impact uh, by collecting scientific data. So that's all on my aquatic reserve uh, kind of info dump there. Lots of 
cool facts and uh, habitats and species that we we see. And I'm going to shift gears onto our uh, monitoring projects. So this list is kind of meant to show how show the breadth of the work that we do. So we we tackle a lot of projects and. Once again, it shows how we how much we really appreciate the help of collaborate, collaborators and community members to help get all of this done and collect all this data. But I'm only going to be focusing on a few of the <laughs> projects. Um, so first, I want to mention the larval light trap project again, which we conduct up at Cherry Point and also in um, Nisqually Reach. But the reason it's so important in trade point is because we're monitoring for the larval herring that I mentioned at the beginning are really declining over the years, and then also Dungeness crab. Um, and then I also wanted to point out the Aquatic Reserves Program newsletter, which is a really cool quarterly uh, email that can provide uh, you with updates about the, the goings on and on the reserves and any news or events. So I can provide information on how to subscribe to that at the end. <laughs> And then I'm going to go into more depth on my two favorite projects, which are uh, seagrass monitoring and invasive European green crab monitoring. So first we have seagrass net monitoring, which is uh, similar to the winter and summer beach monitoring efforts. We get to go out on both nighttime and daytime surveys during the, the lowest tides of the year. And we conduct this monitoring at five of our sites. Uh, five of our reserves, there's five sites, uh, one in, in Birch Bay, Strawberry Bay, Thompson Spit, Neal Point, and um, Sandy Bay. So Seagrass Net is actually a global monitoring effort that was established to collect data on the status of uh, seagrass sea ecosystems. And we follow their protocol to uh, return to the same transect at each site four times a year. So once every season, and uh, it's a 50 meter transect that is just a line on the beach that we visit, just like uh, <laughs> similar again to the beach monitoring, our world watches beach monitoring. And um, the reason we do this is because seagrass is a really ecologically important ecosystem, provides a lot of critical habitat for so, so many species. So Here's a photo of a dense bed of seagrass below our transect in Protection Island Aquatic Reserve. And then here's a, an example of our nighttime surveys that um, we helped out with another group at DNR. Um, so we go out there with headlamps and measure things like density, uh, percent cover. We also measure the length of eelgrass blades. So collect a lot of Cool data over time. And then um, there's an example of one of our quadrats that we'll sample in the lower left. So um, seagrass net kind of has become my passion project through the through my time with the Department of Natural Resources. I had a lot of fun kind of diving deep into the, the database that we have, which is uh, stored in Microsoft Access. And then I've also had a lot of fun coding with uh, R to visualize some of the data and really uh, make it more accessible for people. Um, so I've been working on not only quality assurance and quality control, which is just as mundane as <laughs> checking uh, the data that we collect on a data sheet versus what we have in the, in the access database and just making sure everything is uh, kind of as perfect as we can, as little mistakes as possible, and and then also creating an automated coding script to check for any mistakes as we continue to collect more data. So uh, here's just an example of one of the graphs that I've created for um, some of our seagrass at Trey Point up north. And since this like I said, this monitoring is just one transect line on the beach. It's only really giving us like a, a snapshot of what's happening at one location in a, what is often a vast eelgrass meadow on the beach. So I'm looking forward to participating on uh, boat surveys with uh, another uh, Department of Natural Resources 
uh, program to map seagrass with sonar, which will hopefully get a larger, spa uh, larger spatial scale of change over time with potential movement of the beach or seal grass um, compared to our single line transect surveys. And now shifting to the invasive European green crab monitoring, which is a great project we do in our reserves and then also with collaborators up north. Uh, so invasive, uh, the invasive green crab was first detected in Washington in 1998 out on the outer coast. And then it was first detected in the inland shorelands, uh, shorelines of Puget Sound in 2016. So the major goal of this project is really just prevention. Um, we collaborate with a lot of different groups like uh, Department of Fish and Wildlife and the Washington Sea Grant crab team. And we're so concerned about this invasion because green crab poses a threat to native organisms through competition and predation, as well as uh, habitat destruction. And there's just a photo of one of the green crabs we, we caught last year up in Drayton Harbor. <clears throat> so, like I said, Drayton Harbor and Birch Bay are uh, some of the locations we help out help out with up north. And then we also monitor for green crab in Cypress Island Aquatic Reserve and the Squally Reach Aquatic Reserve. Uh, so we, um, I, I have a picture of a green crab here that is, you can sort of see is kind of greenish, but you never wanna go by color when you're trying to identify a crab. Uh, that's kind of the last check <laughs> in your list of, of uh, crab ID. So when you're looking for a green crab, you definitely wanna look out for the five marginal teeth on their carapace here. And um, then you'll, you'll know whether or not you have a green crab on your hands. Um, so up in Drayton Harbor and Birch Bay, we, uh, do extensive, we help out with extensive trapping efforts really to, to pinpoint locations where these crabs are commonly found and try and capture all of them. So this is actually the only place that I've seen green crabs, um, and, but they're also commonly found out on the coast, like I said, in Willapa Bay and Grace Harbor. Um, and one of my favorite field work days actually of all time was <laughs> helping out with a uh, uh, effort to to trap the entirety of Drayton Harbor in one week, uh, which is just a huge, uh, huge project that we um, spent many miles trudging through mud and carrying heavy packs of the traps on our backpacks. And uh, luckily we would get the assistance from the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife's airboat, which is shown here. And then I also have a, a short video of what it was like to zoom around over the mud flats on this boat, uh, which is a welcome, welcome reprieve from trudging through the mud. I think we need to talk to Lindsay about uh, getting a, a grant for a Harbor Wild Watch airboat for our Austin Estuary efforts. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, that's a muddy site. Yeah, it look, looks like a little bit more of an extensive mud flat than our <laughs> harbor location, but that looks really fun. <laughs> Maybe air shoes, air shoes Ooh. would get us there. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so man. this uh, this effort that we did to to trap the whole bay was about uh, 800 traps in total. And luckily we found 11 <laughs> green crabs through that uh, large effort, which is kind of a funny thing with invasion ecologists that I've met, they, they kind of have a hard time with like, whether or not it's like a good thing or a bad thing that they're <laughs> catching green crabs. It's obviously a good thing ecologically, but sometimes they're like, oh, we only caught 11. Like we trapped 800, <laughs> like dang, like, but we still, really um, are making a positive impact by making sure that we're, we're capturing them all. So Cypress Island is our Northern uh, green crab site that we return to. And the reason it's a green crab site is because it's a salt marsh estuary, which is kind of green crab's favorite habitat location. And we 
uh, common, we've never found a green crab at this site, luckily, but the trapping that we do uh, also helps to establish baseline uh, biodiversity data. So like you can see here, there's lots of sculpin and shore crabs that will still count and record. And then our southern green crab site is on Anderson Island. And um, these are just two of many uh, green crab sites throughout the sound and the coast that site guardians, many volunteers uh, help to, to monitor in the summer months. And it's just really cool to be on the, the front lines of this uh, monitoring effort and early detection program of uh, green crab. So that is all that I have for you today. Uh, once again, I just wanna say how honored I am to be able to be here today presenting about my current work, highlighting the aquatic reserves and the monitoring that we conduct on these reserves. Uh, and yeah, I'm excited to hear if there's any questions. Um, if I don't happen to get to a question, you think of one later, you can always feel free to email me. Um, and I also have some additional resources for you all if you're curious about learning more about what I've been talking about, because there's just tons of information out there about the aquatic reserves. And believe it or not, I only covered <laughs> the surface level of all of it. Um, and then also I might send the, the longer links to the, uh, uh, how to subscribe to the Aquatic Reserves newsletter to Sina to maybe disperse as well. So any questions? <laughs> I will happily disperse that for you, Chris. Well, first Thank of you. all, uh, we had a nice, at least 17 people tuned in and kind of nice. like and flowing. So that's a good number for a sunny day right before St. Patrick's Day. Yeah. Um, and yeah, just thank you so much for talking about, I didn't, I, I didn't know we had so many aquatic reserves and, uh, it's cool to kind of see those similarities between the beach monitoring to some of the stuff you do. And I know we work with the Nisqually Reach folks sometimes, and I feel like I have a better understanding of what they're up to. So right. thank yeah. you again so much. Thank <laughs> uh, it, you. Does look, it does look like we have some questions coming in. Uh, awesome. And again, for those of you watching, uh, type those questions into the comment uh, section and I will field those Chris's way. It looks like Joyce is chiming in wondering can i plant seagrass on my waterfront would that help the south sound you know i've heard of people that help with eelgrass um, restoration and we don't do any of that in the aquatic reserves program but i'm sure there might be resources out there maybe stina you know i'm not sure that is the answer uh but that's a great question i know that um, one of my projects out of Willowwood Bay was to transplant field grass, and um, it can be done, but I'm not sure in your particular location or uh, yeah, I feel what like species there was are there. A, a transplant project out at Penrose Point State Park as well, and I, I would be curious to figure out, you know, where how that all turned out because I don't exactly know what the what the result was if it worked out well. I know eelgrass is finicky, so. Can be. <laughs> But yeah, you would think it would help out, but I, I would I would have to do more research. That's a great question. Great question, Joyce. We'll, we'll keep wondering, but uh, I would say maybe protect the eelgrass that is there. If, but that might be step one. Uh, Kylie is chiming in, just uh, saying so many great pictures. Agree. <laughs> Thanks, um, Kylie. <laughs> particularly inspired by the epic mudflats that I'm... <laughs> Glad you're trudging through. Uh, I was wondering, yeah, how well did your work in Austin Estuary prepare you for trudging through mud flats um, like the ones where you have an airboat to go through? Really well. I think it it was the initial days of my love for for trudging through mud. <laughs> Excellent, beautiful. Yeah. I feel like field work has one of those things, like there's kind of a misery factor, but like it also makes it so fun and silly that it's a really good bonding thing. So it looks like you have a really fun team to trudge through mud with, which is great. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Eileen's chiming in to ask, what are the reasons that the eelgrass beds are declining in the Puget Sound? It's a really good question. And I also do not know the answer. We. Once again, it's it's just a decline that we're noticing on one line at one site, or you know, it's it's hard to really make those 
those calls about whether or not the whole meadow is decreasing or not, and we're we're not quite sure yet. So hopefully with our sonar mapping, we'll get a better understanding of like broader uh, spatial um, changes in abundance of eelgrass. But if there is actually a, a decrease in populations, there could be so many factors that play into that and could, could really be anything from climate change to um, other human anthropogenic uh factors there could be so many things yeah i don't have a clear answer on that one but it's a great question as well <laughs> more, more baseline study i know i really appreciated yeah. having you out um i don't know it's cool when the student becomes the teacher and you're showing us the trick for identifying the difference between the native eelgrass species and the non-native eelgrass species and um, I'm I'm curious with the sonar mapping, is there a way to tell the difference between the different species of eelgrass, or does it all just kind of lump? You know, one's higher intertidally, lower inter. Like, can you tell? I, I'm not sure. I would guess maybe not because it's kind of just sonar. You know, bounces off of right. the the so they'll see like a higher clump of eelgrass, and then the their habitat, so they'll be able to tell the difference between that. But that's kind of a great reason to continue doing both, because both types of surveys, because then you can get finer scale data with the transect versus broader scale, um, big picture stuff with, hopefully, with the sonar. I've never done any sonar yet, so I, I don't know, yeah. Well, we'll have to have you come back and do a <laughs> our presentation. <laughs> oh gosh, yeah. <laughs> uh, for the eelgrass transect, is that at a specific tidal height or is that more of like the cross-section profile line type thing? It's approximately at the zero foot tidal line, I think at most sites, it might vary um, site to site, but the seagrass net protocol actually has calls for three different tidal heights. There's an upper, a middle, and a lower, A, B, and C. And we only do the, the B transect at our sites. But um, just because of uh, the number of people that we have to allocate for these efforts and how difficult it can be to get out to some of these sites at night, like Cypress Island, for instance, got to get there by boat in the middle of the night <laughs> in the winter. <laughs> That and, takes winter beach monitoring to a whole new level. <laughs> wow. Yeah, shout out to my to my boss and some of the staff members that bring us out there at night and are the boat captains. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, what fun. That kind of goes nicely with Lindsay's question. Uh, also, just a big thank you from her. Uh, we're, we're so proud to see you continue to follow your passion to protect the Puget Sound. Oh, uh, Lindsay with the heartstring. <laughs> Thank uh, you, Lindsay. But, yeah, she, I think, is going to heartstring some more here, wondering what has been your most unique or memorable experience in your AmeriCorps position so far? Hmm. I kind of mentioned one uh, with the green crab trapping. That's been a lot of fun. And we've done multiple days of that. We get to go out and, and meet other scientists that are working with different agencies. And um, let's see, I think uh, one of my uh, summer monitoring uh, experiences out on Cypress Island, which is actually the picture here behind my additional resources, the, uh, the getting to go up there and, and hike around and, and explore the island was a lot of fun too. We get to go to some really, really special places that not a lot of people get to visit. So that's definitely a highlight for sure. I imagine you're, you're a person who would appreciate that uh, special access, I think. So yeah. uh, glad you're out there enjoying it. Um, curious with the green shore crabs, if you see them and are able to correctly identify them, what should you do if you find a green shore crab in the South Sound? Yeah, um, well, hopefully we won't <laughs> find them in the yeah. South Sound for a while. But I think the furthest south might be Port Townsend so far. And there is a, a green crab hotline, but um, there's a lot of also additional resources on the Washington Sea Grant green crab team or crab team, I think is what it's called, website on how to identify them. And um, they will happily, uh, if it is a green crab, they'll happily probably come out and <laughs> get it for you or find some way to, to meet up with you to, 
to remove it from the, the environment. Yeah. Nice. And I, I imagine like, you know, is this a survey where you're like crab cookout at the end of it? Or like, what are we doing here? <laughs> you know, that's, that's funny. I think they just freeze them. It's the, okay. the euthanization method. And then they um, keep them for further studies. Maybe down the line, they're going to want to look at uh, more like physiological data or uh, their DNA, perhaps. I don't know. Uh, but yeah. No cookouts, unfortunately. <laughs> I, I was imagining back when we were talking, you know, the non-native oysters were coming in. I was mm. like, do need to do hot sauce surveys? Is this, is this our next step? But right. turns out they've been here for a while. So uh, mm. that kind of leads into Lucinda's question, wondering, um, she's popping in late, but uh, Lucinda and anyone else, you can watch this full thing. It will be posted live at the end of this broadcast. So feel free to catch up with what you missed. But I don't think Chris mentioned it about why the non-native eelgrass is designated noxious. Ooh, that's a great question. I've heard that the, the Zoster japonica is classified as a noxious weed, but I'm guessing it's just because it's it's so, widespread and invasive. I, I don't know much about that status of that species. Yeah, I think it, it opens up such the, good that conversation <laughs> of like the non-native versus invasive versus mm -hmm. naturalized versus what's our different value judgments on different ecological habitats. Like, yay, eelgrass, it provides habitat. But, you know, if this eelgrass is competing with say clams or other economically or ecologically important things. Uh, Lucinda, you're opening a complicated can of worms here. <laughs> yeah, I know people that are getting their PhD studying the like the difference between native versus non-native. It's a it's a complex question. Yeah. Absolutely. I don't know that I but I don't know the answer to to whether or not why they are specifically noxious weeds. Yeah, uh, another question we probably don't know the answer to, but just in case, <laughs> Lindsay's wondering, what do they do with the lionfish in the Florida Keys? Another invasive, non-native yeah. species. Uh, right over lionfish my head, species. I'm not sure. Species surveys, this is my, I think I like food, it's fine. <laughs> is it dinner time? I don't know. <laughs> um, yes, uh, let's see. Lindsay's popping in some resources into the chat. Uh, Thanks, Lindsay. Eelgrass Yay. stuff. So we can read further later. Uh, I'm going to do a quick little scroll through and see if we have any other questions coming in through the chat. <laughs> Otherwise, oh, we have some puffin love coming in. Yeah. Uh, our 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 presentation last month was with Dr. Peter Hodum all about Salish Sea seabirds. And we got to feature the puffins and Protection Island came up as well as Smith Island, I believe. And so yes. uh, I think if you'd like, again, that's posted online. So there's a nice overlap between both of your talks here. And uh, it's like, like you teed it up for us here. <laughs> uh, yeah, lots of people tuning in. Susan Conroy Gendry says hello, watching this <laughs> note. Uh, great. Well, it looks at least to me. Oh, here we go. Uh, we have Kylie tuning in to say thanks for the great presentation. Cool presentation, Chris. Uh, thanks, and Kylie. Susan asking, does Harbor Wild Watch work with DNR? <laughs> we should. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> um, I know we definitely we've started adding some of that uh, seagrass monitoring at our uh, lower foot tidal height because I think seagrass for what for whatever reason is a lot lower in the intertidal zone in the South Sound and so kind of matching those monitoring protocols is hard to do because the access to the seagrass is usually underwater at that point right. so um we're like snorkel surveys question yeah. mark <laughs> some people at dnr do that they do snorkel surveys but they only do them i think in the summer and springtime <laughs> that feels like the right move yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah we haven't quite we've we've just added it as you know as one of those transects and usually there's zeros but zeros are important too they are yeah 
And yeah. so, uh, yeah, I think there's definitely um, some crossover in the community science that Harbor Wild Watch does to the work that DNR is doing. And uh, it's good to, uh, I think, you know, an inspiration to further our conversations and collaboration because gee golly, I would be glad to work with you, Chris. So Say it likewise. Uh, yeah. bring on those community projects for us. <laughs> yeah. Okay, and then finally, uh, yeah, oh, Lindsay's mentioning on the, the DNR comment uh, that we do work with the KGI watershed uh, partnerships, but yeah, more DNR, we'd be down. So with that, again, love is pouring in through the comments. Uh, thank you so much, Chris, for sharing your knowledge and stories and photos, and we are just so excited to have you on tonight and this is the part where i turn it over to you for a second <laughs> to say any last words while i try and find the button to say m live video so, <laughs> yeah anything else before we go no i mean you're so welcome thank you so much for having me i i i love the idea of this being full circle i i totally agree it's fun to to come and and share how much her world has inspired me and how much it's uh influenced me to to continue working on the uh working in the field of biology yeah uh, melting our hearts here chris i feel like that rainbow slide you had that's yes. like the yeah. prime there thing here there it is <laughs> <laughs> um, and with that we'll end with just a couple of little harbor wild watch announcements we do have volunteer training coming up because guess what folks we are going to be back in the field doing in-person programs as long as they're outside so we start april 5th i believe and we'll be doing tuesday digital zoom sessions uh, doing some like a workshop series and then we'll cap that off with a field trip to get people ready to join us out on the beach and tell people about the wondrous adaptations that the different cool creatures have in the Sailor Sea, many of which Chris touched on tonight. Uh, I'm hoping an elephant seal or a minky whale, like, you know, we, we could wish for some bigger marine mammals too to join our party, but yeah, invertebrate crew, baby. Uh, we're all about those backboneless friends, so. Uh, that should be pretty fun. We're definitely looking forward to uh, getting together with, with our people again this summer and getting out on the beach. So if you're interested in, in that, you can always email me or check out the Wild Side Weekly. It has links to register for that Zoom link. We'll be posting more Facebook events and things like that. So if you're interested, definitely stay tuned to get involved there. We also, of course, have Cocktails and Fish Tales coming up next month featuring Rebecca Mostow. She will be talking about more coastal community science. So uh, we, we've got a thing going on here. It'll be uh, really fun to hear from her, uh, as well as just stay tuned for more digital programs, as well as some more in-person things coming up. And I'm excited to announce that the Scansy House is back open. So if you'd like to come visit Harbor Wild Watch and all our fun exhibits, uh, learn about where the best place to eat fish and chips is, you can stop by the Visitor Center uh, in downtown Gig Harbor. The Scansy Visitor Interpretive Center is open Wednesdays through Saturdays, 10 to four. So come say hi, see what's up, learn, have fun. And again, thanks for tuning in this evening for this fabulous, bleh, I'm so excited. <laughs> this fabulous full circle cocktails and fish tales with Chris Gendry. So thanks again, Chris. Thanks for everybody tuning in. We'll uh, sign off here. Thanks, Tina. Thank Let you, everyone. <laughs>